Hi, this is Pastor Dale Capron at Lacey Spring United Methodist Church. This is our Wednesday Bible study. We're going to be reading Galatians chapter 2. I hope that you've already watched the video on Galatians 1. And I encourage you to read along in your own translation, whatever version of the Bible that you prefer, as we go through Galatians chapter 2. Let's have a short prayer before we get started. Holy God, I pray that you open up our minds and our hearts to the truth of your living word. Reveal to us uh, things we need to learn, things we need to grow, uh, areas of our lives that need to change. By your holy name we pray. Amen. We saw in the first chapter of Galatians that Paul was talking about how he was an apostle of Christ, called by God, and was not approved of by men. In Galatians chapter 2, we're going to continue on that theme about the difference of God's approval versus men uh, approving and uh, the different ways that Paul interacted with other early church leaders. We're going to go verse by verse, so starting Galatians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again in Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. So 14 years have now passed, uh, 14 years of ministry, 14 years of Paul doing his own work, not seeking the approval of the leaders in Jerusalem. So that's a pretty significant length of time. That's a long time to be in ministry, to be planting churches, encouraging the growth of existing churches, to be calling people to Come be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. But after 14 years, he does go up to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was considered the center of the church as much as it was the center of Judaism. So going up to Jerusalem is going up to the early church's leadership. The people that were recognized as the leaders of the early church. He goes with Barnabas and Titus, and we can presume that Barnabas and Titus uh, share Paul's views on these matters. When he has uh, disagreements with other early church leaders, we can assume that Barnabas and Titus are on Paul's side. They were disciples under him. They learned to be ministers in their own right under Paul. So they probably favor Paul's position more than others. Going on to verse 2. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. So he says he goes to Jerusalem by revelation. In other words, God called Paul to go to Jerusalem after these 14 years. Paul did not go by a summons from the early church leaders. He did not go to please other people, but rather he went because God had called him to do it. God had given him a, a revelation, a vision of going to Jerusalem. So this is Paul saying that he still didn't go to Jerusalem because other people wanted him to. He went to Jerusalem because God had asked him to. It says he meets privately with those esteemed as leaders. We're going to learn more about them in just a few minutes. Uh, I presented the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. So he comes and, and gives the church leadership a little glimpse on what he's preaching and teaching. So they can judge for themselves whether he is right or not. I want to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. He wants to make sure that the gospel they're preaching and the gospel that he's preaching are essentially the same. I think he's curious uh, Paul is very assertive in the idea that he's an apostle of Christ. Uh, he's not necessarily looking for their rubber stamp, but rather going to compare their gospel to his gospel. Verse 3, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. So now we see part of the argument here that the Jerusalem leadership was encouraging Gentiles, encouraging Greek people to be circumcised. In other words, to become Jewish first, 
and then to become Christian. It was an extra step in the process that some early Christian leaders believed was necessary. Since Jesus was Jewish, most of the disciples were Jewish, most of the early church was Jewish, they thought you had to first become Jewish before you could become Christian. So here is Paul, who's been accompanied by Titus, and he says not even Titus was swayed by their argument to be circumcised. So we can sympathize with Titus not wanting to be circumcised as an adult. Uh, we understand why he wouldn't be interested in that. But uh, more importantly, he wasn't swayed by the argument that they were making. Verse 4. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. So certain people had come into Paul's group and they had observed that they did not make Gentiles be circumcised. Paul and, and Barnabas and Titus and, and the other leaders that were with Paul, like Timothy, did not believe that the Gentiles or the Greeks had to be circumcised before becoming Christian. They only needed to become Christian to convert from whatever Gentile religion they had to Christianity and not have this midway point, this stepping stone in Judaism. So uh, Paul speaks pretty harshly of them, uh, that they were trying to take away our freedom and make us slaves. Paul, throughout his writings, uh, is very assertive in the idea that circumcision is part of the old law. The old law kept Jewish people slaves. It kept them uh, boxed in, and Christ sets us free. So Paul is not interested in going back to the old law. Verse 5, we did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So remember, Paul is writing this letter to the church in the area of Galatia, sorry, multiple churches in the area of Galatia. He says, we did not give in for a moment. So they stood their ground, even though the pro-Jerusalem group was encouraging circumcision Paul and the other leaders did not back off. Uh, I think it's pretty important that Paul stood his ground here for the growth of the early church to include Gentiles, for the church to spread like wildfire in the first few centuries of its existence. Uh, I think most of us in the church today uh, would be considered Gentiles. So for us to be in the church, it's still important today that Paul stood his ground so many years ago. Now on to verse 6. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. So when Paul compared his gospel to the gospel being preached by the Jerusalem leadership, they did not see any difference. They were essentially preaching the same gospel. He says they added nothing to my message. So Paul, again, uh, being forceful in his claim that he's an apostle uh, called by God, and he was waiting eagerly to hear if the Jerusalem leadership could add something theologically to what he was already preaching and teaching, and he says they added nothing. So it's kind of an aggressive way of saying that their gospel was not better than his gospel, right? This was kind of a disagreement or a showdown of sorts. He says their gospel was not greater than my gospel. They're, they added nothing to my message. And he even takes the time to say whatever they were makes no difference to me. And uh, claiming that he's in the same level, same category as the Jerusalem leaders. In other words, he doesn't care about their title, their rank. It's very clear Paul cares about his title and his rank. He proclaimed himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. But uh, he's not impressed with the Jerusalem leadership's titles. Verse 7. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. 
So, there's a recognition here from the Jerusalem leadership that Paul's gospel is authentic. It's very important in the history of the early church. We know that today there are many different theological arguments between churches. But uh, this very early argument between Paul and the Jerusalem leadership, they see a common purpose. They see that Paul is to go to preach to the uncircumcised as much as Peter is to preach to the circumcised, as much as Peter was for the Jewish people. Verse 8. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. That's essentially the same as the previous verse. Verse 9. James, Cephas, and John, and Cephas is another name for Peter or Simon Peter, James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. So we had to wait until all the way into Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, to find out who these pillars were. These esteemed leaders in the church in Jerusalem that Paul did not name, did not mention all the way up to Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, he mentioned Peter briefly in Galatians 1, and James the brother of Jesus very briefly in Galatians chapter 1. But he left open who the pillars of the church were. Well, now we know who they are. There's three of them. He names three. James. Not James, a disciple of Jesus, but James, the brother of Jesus. Cephas, who's also called Simon, or Peter. And John. These were the three men esteemed as pillars in the Jerusalem church. And Paul claims that he and Barnabas were welcomed into fellowship by these three leaders. So now, if Paul wants to claim that his ministry does have the recognition, the authority of the Jerusalem pillars. Now he has it. Because now he can point to this moment in time where James and Peter and John recognized his ministry, grasped his hand in a handshake, and said, we are brothers. We are preaching the same gospel. So they extend the right hand of fellowship when they recognize the grace given to Paul. They recognize Christ's anointing on Paul. Very important stuff. And I know we might take all of this for granted and say it's not important, but for the early church to not be divided at this point, in order for Paul to be in the same church as Peter and James and John, along with Barnabas and Titus, in order for them to at least be unified in the sense that they have one gospel. He says repeatedly throughout here they have different missions, right? Some to the circumcised and some to the uncircumcised. But it's important for there to be one gospel, one message, that the early church is spreading uh, throughout the world at this time. And we see time and time again when Paul becomes frustrated that other teachers are teaching false gospels. That comes up over and over again in his ministry. Let's uh, finish verse 9. They agreed, those are the pillars, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So one gospel being sent uh, one, same gospel, no, no difference in the gospel, the same message, but it's going to, in two different directions. One to the Gentiles, which he also calls the uncircumcised, and one to the Jews, which are the circumcised. Verse 10, All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. So now Paul is claiming that throughout this process, He'd been asking for their financial support for the poor. And they're apparently not very willing to give that support until they confirm his gospel. Until they confirm that Paul's gospel is authentic and true, 
They don't want to support his ministry. So now that they've grasped the right hand of fellowship, as he, that's his phrasing there, now that he and Barnabas are fully accepted, they agree on their mission to the poor. It is kind of inspirational to me to think that in the year 2020, the church is still in mission and ministry to the poor. Not that I'm glad that we have the poor with us. It's not that poverty uh, has to be something in our society, but the church still cares. The church still loves. The church still desires to help those that are in need. We see and hear Paul's heart for this in the very earliest days of the church. And now today, even our church is packing boxes to go to kids for Christmas in Honduras, and we're um, gathering uh, food baskets to take to, to local missions. We're dividing up the bread delivery to carry to, to people that might be hungry. It's, it's still this ministry, still this mission for the church. Paul was eager to do it in his time, and we have many people eager to do it today. Let's continue with Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. So after all these verses about Paul being in sync with the other church leaders, with them approving of one another and shaking each other's hands, now at verse 11, all of a sudden, Paul jumps into an argument. Uh, he confronts Peter. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. So Paul is not afraid to be confrontational. He's not afraid to stand up for what he believes in. And he's willing to confront Simon Peter, Jesus' right-hand man, the disciple that was among the leadership, among the disciples, uh, the first one to recognize Jesus as the Christ. Uh, Paul's not afraid to confront him. Verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. So Peter had been in the practice of beginning to eat, to fellowship with Gentiles and to show no difference between Gentiles and Jews, between uncircumcised and circumcised. And then some people came, it says from James, who was mentioned as one of the earlier pillars in Jerusalem. Certain men uh, came from James, uh, and then he wanted to kind of uh, be in league with them, to be more respected by them. So he started to withdraw from his fellowship with the Gentiles. It's a really subtle thing, but if you think about it, if you're in the church you've been welcomed in as a Gentile and used to fellowship with Peter, but now Peter doesn't want to fellowship with you. Peter's now treating you as a second-class citizen. It's actually a very serious problem. Uh, even though, at first glance, it doesn't seem that important, uh, the, the reaction of the leadership matters. Uh, it matters what Peter does, because Peter is so respected, he's looked up to, He's beloved in the early church. So if Peter is withdrawing from fellowship with the Gentiles, others will do the same thing. On to verse 13. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. Barnabas had been on Paul's side when he went to Jerusalem. Barnabas was with Paul. Barnabas was in that group that wanted to go to the Gentiles and not force them to be circumcised. And now Barnabas is withdrawing a little bit from fellowshipping with the Gentiles. It's so critical for church leadership to demonstrate to other people how to behave. If Peter is withdrawing, and he's doing it to impress James, presumably, back in Jerusalem, and then Barnabas starts to withdraw... Pretty soon you have a church that's split in half. You've got Jews sitting on one side and Gentiles sitting on the other. Rather than 
following Paul's words that in Christ there is no longer any Gentiles or Jews. We're all the same. So it could become a very serious problem. It's not at a point yet where the church is breaking in half, but it could become that way. We could easily see how this argument, this disagreement, could grow and become a much bigger problem. Verse 14. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So this begins a quotation of Paul, which is going to go to the end of the chapter. Every, all the other verses are, are quoted. Uh, uh, quotations attributed to Paul. Uh, he, when he confronts Peter, he says, You are a Jew, but you live like a Gentile, because in Christ he's been freed. Uh, Peter had a whole experience of a vision from God that showed him he could eat and fellowship with Gentiles. Now he's going back on that. Uh, how is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Uh, it has to be deeply disappointing to someone who is a missionary to the Gentiles to see that the Gentiles are not being respected. The Gentiles are not being welcomed into full fellowship. So Paul is willing to confront him in front of everyone. Back in verse 11 when it says he opposed Peter to his face, now, all the way down to verse 14, it's revealed to us what he actually says. So the rest of this quotation is intended to be taken as Paul's argument against Peter when he was confronting him to his face. Verse 15, We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles. So Paul and Peter, both Jewish so he's claiming this brotherhood of we are Jews by birth, you know, you and I, you know, putting himself together with Peter. We were not born sinful Gentiles. I think that's kind of intended in an ironic way. We weren't born as those poor Gentiles. We were born Jewish and we're lucky to have been Jewish. Verse 16, we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. So many people think that we have to justify ourselves by works. We have to earn God's love. We have to do enough to impress God. And it's just not true. We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus is the only thing that saves. And now Paul's going to make the argument that as Jewish people, he and Peter ought to know that better than anyone else. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. So they, he mentions they were born Jewish, they had lived their whole lives according to Jewish custom, but that wasn't enough. They still need to be justified by faith in Christ. And they could not have worked their way to saving faith. They couldn't have done it. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. The works of the law do not bring justification. The works of the law can bring us closer to God. It can help us become more disciplined. It can help us to rein in our, our sinful desires and passions. But justification comes by faith alone. And that faith has to be placed in Jesus Christ. So, if we're justified by faith, we no longer need to be justified by the law. Verse 17. But if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews, he and Peter find ourselves also among the sinners. Doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. Uh, just because they fellowship with the sinners, just because they're around them, ministering to them, caring for the poor who might be sinners, 
That doesn't make them sinners. It doesn't mean that Christ is a, approving or promoting sin. It just means that Christ cares. And they, as early church leaders, also care and are promoting the gospel, which is for sinners. If the gospel is for sinners and we never go talk to sinners, then the gospel is not being shared with the people who need to hear it. Verse 18. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. If I rebuild what I destroyed, what had he destroyed? He'd thrown away the law. He'd thrown away the regulations that separated him from the Gentiles. Paul, in his mission to the Gentiles, gave up the idea that he couldn't eat with them, that he couldn't fellowship with them, that he couldn't be around them. Because if he's not around them and fellowshipping with them and eating with them, how can he share the gospel with them? It doesn't make any sense. So if he rebuilds the law, in other words, if he starts telling them, yeah, you do need to be circumcised, and we can't eat unclean food with Gentiles, and you know, separating the Jews from the Gentiles again, after Christ had united them together. Christ had made them one people, and they want to be two people again doesn't make any sense. It undoes the work that Paul was trying to do. Verse 19. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. So here, as clearly as Paul puts it anywhere in his writings, I died to the law, so I could live to God. The law is just not sufficient. In Christ, we die to it, we, we break the chains. We are free. We are no longer slaves to that law. And in Christ, we are set free. We don't want to put ourselves back into slavery. Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The famous quotation, famous verse. It's in Christian contemporary uh, music songs. I've been crucified with Christ. What does he mean? It means that his old life, before he met Jesus, before Jesus came and knocked him off his donkey on the road to Damascus, that old life is dead. It's dead. It's gone. Throw it away. As much as Christ's own body was dead on the cross and laid into a grave, our old lives are, are, are toast. They're, they're dead, they're gone, they no longer matter. Now, just as Christ rose to new life, the Christian believer, including Paul, walks a new life. I now live for Christ. The old life is gone. And if we are a people, if we say to ourselves, I haven't had that big life transformation, or I don't know if I really believe, or I've, I've always kind of had head knowledge, but it's never affected my life. We're missing out on what Paul is saying here. Paul's saying when you accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the old life is dead. It, it's in the ground, six feet under, not coming back. And even if you were been in the church your whole life, You've always believed in Christ. You've always attended church. As a kid, you were in Sunday school. You were in children's ministry, youth ministry. You just always believed. Even so, at some point in your life, you make a personal decision to follow Jesus Christ. And that choice, if it's real and it's genuine and Christ is in your heart, uh, every other day of your life prior to that day doesn't matter anymore. And now every day forward is a, life, is a day that you live for Christ. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So now he's continuing to live bodily, physically. His life continues. But he is dedicating that life to the pursuit of loving Jesus Christ. Of living for him. Of sacrificing for him. 
being willing to be thrown in jail for him, being willing to be beaten and stoned for the gospel. He can do all those things because he lives for Jesus Christ, uh, not for his own desires. Verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness can be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Paul clearly realizes that the new life in Christ is given to us by grace, cannot be earned, and you can't work your way towards it by the law. The law was not leading to that conclusion. The old law code was a self-contained box that kept people doing the same practices repeatedly, but never getting past those things. You had to sacrifice uh, for your sins, but as soon as you sinned again, you had to sacrifice again. Christ breaks that cycle by being the one sacrifice for all people, for all time. So once he's in us, we no longer live for ourselves, but he lives within us. And we certainly don't want to be on the side of thinking that Christ died for nothing. Because in truth, Christ died for everything. I hope you've enjoyed this Bible study on Galatians chapter 2, and that the next video, uh, Galatians chapter 3, you'll tune in and enjoy it, uh, feel closer to Christ, and enjoy reading his word. Let's close with the word of prayer. Holy Lord, we thank you for Paul, who fought for the right of Gentiles to be in the church. He fought against division. He fought for the idea of one gospel and how we don't want to be divided or together in the family we call the church. We pray, Lord, for unity. We pray we accept one another in spite of our failings. And we pray, Lord, that you teach us what it means to live a new life for Christ. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you.